are you? I'm well. Um, always love our little chats and people do listening as well. Likewise. So thank you for taking the time. Just just before I look at the book, um, how have you been um, with regards to your neurological disorder and disease? Is, is it progressing or have you managed to stall it or where are you at? Uh, it's progressing. Um, certainly the pain is an awful lot worse. Um, I'm finding mobility is a little bit more of a challenge. But that's that said, I, I kind of, um, I, I also look on the other, the, the bright side and I say that I'm trying this new hydrogen, molecular hydrogen treatment and that is definitely helping. This is where I, um, I have one of these um, hydrogen generators, which which is frontline medicine in Japan, South Korea. It's it's unheard of here, and uh, I've been using that now for the last couple of months. And I tend to use it during the night. I'm talking like three, four, five in the morning when I can't sleep because of the pain. Um, and I literally just lie there with a cannula on, inhaling this in bed, propped up against the pillows. Um, and I've become a bit of an expert now on classical music as a result, but it's, it helps. But I, I, it, I, I don't know whether it will help to the extent that it will slow it down yeah. or whether it's simply just a kind of a form of anaesthetic, you know. Is it just pain management or is it slowing the progression? You don't know. It's an awful illness in that regard, isn't it? It's a creeping one. Yeah, they call it the beast. They don't call it the beast for nothing. It's a, it's a, it's a horrendous illness it just keeps taking and taking and taking and for anybody who's never heard of it it's somewhere between uh, Parkinson's and motor neuron disease so it would have many of the characteristics and symptoms of both of those certainly towards the later stages of multiple system atrophy it's very similar to the end stages of motor neuron disease so the central nervous system is literally breaking down in some people it breaks down at a faster level um, but I'm, I'm definitely beginning to feel the, the effects of it now throughout. Like, I think the last time I spoke to you, um, it was definitely a kind of, um, it, it was, it was, as it were, it, it, it was containing itself within the neck and I suppose the legs, but now I can feel it right out to my fingertips and my toes and that. So it's, it's, it's really reaching right out to the extremities now and causing a lot of discomfort. And do do you know whether this was something genetic or that you were born with, or is it as a result of your life path, or, 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 or you know, or what? Well, see, this is there's a lot of research going on. See, the the, the whole genetic thing, um, they they tend to one of the reasons they they they. Um, they rule that Parkinson's is because Parkinson's is hereditary. That if you look back through different stages of the generations in a family, if there's Parkinson's there, there's a possibility that for someone in a generation to come might also develop it. Yeah. But with this, this is such a bizarre illness. It's probably one of the most unknown, less little known illnesses out there. And um, what? What I, I've been doing a lot of research on it and what I have discovered as a result of scientific stuff that's there already is that extreme acute trauma at an early stage of life, unless it's dealt with and unless it, 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 it as it were, is taken out of the way of progressing into life, particularly during childhood, can lead in later life to different disorders, it can lead to cancer, it can lead to um, arthritis, and then it can lead to some of the much bigger neurological illnesses. This is what the scientists are now beginning to believe because they have researched this, and, and it, it's certainly looking that way. And it, I mean, if, you don't have to answer any of these questions if you, if you don't, don't wish That's to, right. but I'm just re- reference, referencing the book. The trauma that you're referring to, would that have been the sexual abuse that you suffered at the hands of a cleric as a child? Yes, most likely it would have. Been, it certainly would have been the beginning. I think because prior to that, um, I had a very, very normal, very happy childhood. Now I was always a bit of a loner, um, as, as a lot of people will say. I was, I was just one of those kids who never really fit in. I had a very happy childhood. Um, I, I had wonderful parents. And God bless my mother, she's still alive, she's nearly 90. Um, but the, the, uh, yes, definitely at that point where the abuse took place at the age of 11, um, that was where my <clears throat> dreamy little childhood world, which is a world as 
all children look back on it and prefer to remember a dreamy, imaginative, um, creative place where you're beginning to learn about things where you you still have a very perfect view of the world that really there's no past and there's not really any future at that stage mm. either because everything exists within this beautiful day. Mm. And then unfortunately, in the case of abuse, it's almost like it, the predator comes along with a sledgehammer and this gorgeous little world, this space and time, it, it just it, it, it evaporates. It, it just explodes into, into itself. And you're basically left frozen in time. Uh, part of you becomes literally like a block of ice. You can't move on um, while, the, the, while the rest of you develops and you, you finish out school, you finish whatever you're doing, you get a job, you get married, you, you move through life. Some people just don't get beyond that stage. Some people, as a result of abuse, drop out, fall into drug abuse, addictions, crime, I, I suppose I was very lucky in that that didn't happen to me. But I do know now, looking back, um, and I'm looking back now 50 years almost, that definitely, I would, I would literally definitely put money on it that in a few years' time, scientists will say, yes, that way back then is very much directly related to what is happening to me now. And is that the first time that you spoke of that? Was it in the book? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, because this is only recent science. Um, this is this is something that really only has kind of come to the fore in the last five, six years. But had you spoken about that abusive episode? Because in the book, it was very devious. The the, the carry on of yeah. this this character, and it was repetitive and unfortunately you were sent back to this place on a number of occasions and it, and it repeated and, and in later life you revisited the scene of the horrible things that happened to you and, and people will read that in the book but, but is this the first time you've spoken publicly about that abuse? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I referred to it vaguely in uh, A Day Called Hope but I, I didn't go into the detail and the reason I wanted to go into the detail here was because I think it, while in, in in terms of my life as such, I, I celebrated my 60th birthday on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, when I look back, um, it was always there lurking in the background. And no matter how much effort I put into trying to exercise this and to try to move beyond it and to try to actually... Um, Ah, just to try to see, you can't remove it from your life because it, it it has become indelibly marked within your entire psyche, but within your entire makeup. Mm. It's 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 almost like um, it it becomes a part of who you are, even though it doesn't directly impinge on your daily activity. And that it it's it's always there, no matter how hard you work on it. There are um, many, many stories to your life that people will not have known anything about. Of course, there's that one, which was devastating. And you speak of the consequences of it years, years later. But, you know, you know, your er- your earlier life, your, your love of music, your, your work within within the Pirates. It's so typical of many of us who followed the radio career and we tried other jobs, you know, you, you tried insurance and incidentally, you were working as a young fool in Switzers in Dublin while I was working as a young fool in Cashes in Cork, both of us <laughs> doing pirate radio at the same time for, for a no, company that owned both shops. That was incredible, that's I thought. Right. Oh, what, what that, that is, that, that's, that's, that's uncanny. Isn't it? That's, that, isn't that crazy, yeah. And, and then there's the lovely story about, about I mean, w- w- there was nothing but niceness in Larry Gogan. So the, that's a beautiful story of your start in 2FM and things like that, isn't it? Larry was, uh, you know, Larry was in a, Larry was a one-off. You, you know, I mean, when they made the the, the, the prototype, uh, uh, they they threw they threw it away. There was never going to be another Larry. And when I was fifteen, as you say, um, I was hooked on Radio Luxembourg, as many of us of, of a certain age would have been. And then Radio Erin, as it was known, people I think under the age of of. of 35 or 40 would never have heard that expression. But, but I, uh, they decided to try to get their act together and they, they decided to expand into popular music programming. And 
During this wonderful summer of 1976, it was one of the hottest on record. I was 15, and I, I, I all I, I loved music. Music was it, it, it was my comfort zone, and uh, I, I lived in this world of music, and I lived in the world of DJs like Peter Powell and Benny Brown, and yeah. you know all of these guys on Luxembourg. And then I heard this there was going to be a, a pop music program in the afternoon of the summer on VHF. They were going to split their frequencies, RTE. And I rang RTE one day. My parents were out and I picked up the phone in the hall, just off the hall table. And you'll remember dialing the number in the clockwise direction. And well, RTE answered and a charming woman who I later ended up working with, Laura, a wonderful woman. I said, could you, could you put me on to somebody who can tell me how I can become a DJ? And there was a moment of silence and she says, oh, well, hold on now and I'll transfer you. So with that phone number, the phone was transferred and uh, the phone was answered by this chirpy voice. He says, hello. <laughs> and I said, oh, hello. And I immediately knew it was Larry Gogan. And, and um, I, he says, how can I help you? And I said, <laughs> it was like listening to him on air. And I said, I'm just wondering, can you give me any information on how to become a radio DJ? <laughs> So he said, well, how old are you? And I said, I'm 15. And he says, well, no. And he went through this procedure where he said, first of all, get a good leaving cert. Uh, listen to music. He said, learn about the artists. Don't restrict your musical choices. Read the music critics, people like Pat Egan, people like Bruce Shields, people like Ken Stewart. They all had columns in Spotlight magazine. Right, and, yeah. and then Hot Press came along in 1977. Then there was Niall Stokes and there was all sorts of people. And he spoke to me for 40 minutes. Wow. And, and I thought, he said, so he says, well, I have to go because I'm on air now in 10 minutes. And I said, well, I'm going to be listening to you. So <laughs> that was it. So, um, And years later, when you started in 2FM, <laughs> did you remind him of that story? 1989 I started and I remember the day I started it was a bank holiday Monday of the Easter weekend that year and the, Kevin Healy the, 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 um, a, a very fine corkman who's probably listening now out in West Cork I hope so uh, he he revamped Radio 2 and he wanted to turn it into an, a really good classic sort of pop mature sounding radio station and he did that and I was air dropped in onto the afternoon show and my first day half four Larry had been on since two he was doing two to half four I was doing half four to seven and I had the headphones on and he had said goodbye and I didn't realize it but he came in out of his studio in around behind me and he tapped me on the shoulder and there he was standing there and I took my headphones off and he said congratulations it took you 14 years but you managed to get here <laughs> Oh I my couldn't God. believe that he remembered. Isn't it incredible, the guy? I mean, yeah. his, just his brain and his mind alone, but his kindness and his compassion yeah. to a young fellow at 15. But, but, but yet, in the book then, during your time within 2FM, you were in very dark places and you were in the throes of dreadful depression. And I, I read in the book that you would come off the air and you would go somewhere in the country or a park or a forest and sleep in the car. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing the breakfast show. Um, I had I took I had taken over the breakfast show for me and Dempsey in nineteen ninety eight, and I, I was I was on breakfast for about two and a half years, and I was going through all I all I can say is it was a darkness that I couldn't climb out of. It was there was a sense of worthlessness, and I I just kept getting deeper and deeper into this. And the only time I actually felt I could cope was when I was on air. And I had I had a better energy level very early in the morning. So I would get to the breakfast show and then I would leave and I would drive up to the Phoenix Park in Dublin. And there was a, a little area there just behind the 15 acres. Many people will know it for where the Pope, Pope John Paul II said mass. And I would just recline the seat in the car and I would sleep for a couple of hours or I might walk around in the, the, the forests up there like completely lost in my head and uh, I had this idea that when it would get too bad what I would do some morning during the show I would, I would wait until the 8 o'clock news bulletin and then I would walk out to the car park 
and tell the guys that were working on the show with me that I was going out to get something from the boot of the car. I would get into the car, would drive to Rosslare, get on the car ferry and go to France and disappear. Incredible. And, yeah. and, and in spite of all of this, with a, a wife and young family and a fantastic job, that was pro- you were probably playing that out, that argument in your head. I have a great job, you know, great oh, prospects, yeah. you know. Yeah. What is wrong yeah. with me? Well, this is it. I, I, I mean, my, my marriage was, was failing at that stage, but I, 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 I was keeping myself in situ for my young children who were still very young at that stage. Yes. But I had this kind of escape hatch plan. That the ferry I to would, France was always on the back The ferry to burner. France, and, and I would, there were, thir- I, remember, I remember researching it, there are 32,000 remote villages in France God. And I remember reading up on them and um, I got one of these travel books in Eason's. There was no internet back then. So it, it was a it was sort of a, a driver, a, a tourist's guide to driving through France. And I had picked out two or three of these beautiful little, um, beautiful little sort of Pyrenees villages where I would uh, learn French fluently, which I was pretty good at anyway, mm. and I would just vanish and change my identity and start all over again. But you didn't, uh, and you stayed. No. And it's the, the book is brutally honest and open because there were there were periods in your life, of course, when when you were dealing with all of this, obviously, where. Um, there was all sorts of financial pressure upon you. At one stage, there was an attachment on your bank account. You were you were penniless. Yeah. You had pretty much nowhere to live. You couldn't pay the rent. You were struggling for much of your life with dr- the dreadful affliction of obsessive compulsive disorder. You detailed that very much. Um, yeah. it's, it's like it's, it's it's so honest and open. Why 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 did you leave two FM? Why, why did you move? Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I remember being asked that question and, and the way it was put to me was, you know, you must have been on massive money in there because everybody who is very well known is on massive money. Now, actually, I, I, when I joined 2FM, I had just missed the gravy train and the bosses who were beginning to settle into their new positions were really pulling back at that stage on salaries and contracts and that. Now, it turned the other way again. Ironically, after I left, the money began to go back up again. People began to, you know, earn like incredibly high salaries. But I know that said, I was very, very well paid. But what happened was in 2005, um, I lost one of my best friends. I had a couple of best friends. One of them died quite unexpectedly. He had a huge influence on my life. We were very close. Um, and also, uh, my my marriage ended early that year. And I didn't like the direction the two of them was going in. And that's quite publicly well known. And I, I voiced it and I said it to a few people. I said, you're reaching out for a younger audience when really our audience is the record size audience that's sitting there listening to us and you're prepared to turn your back on them and fish for young listeners who are already being catered for by so many of the other radio stations around Mm. the country. Mm. Um, And, uh, you know, then they were beginning to say, you know, we'd like you to, we'd like you to to try and to do this and we'd like to change that. And I just said, no, something snapped, Neil, Literally, there was so much going on on so many different levels in my life. Something snapped. And I walked in one day with an envelope and I gave it to the program director and I said, I'm leaving. And I'm leaving next Friday. Wow. And he said, don't leave next Friday. He said, why don't you stay for a few months? I said, I'm leaving next Friday. I've had enough. And I left on Friday. And I remember um, I took a long walk in the Phoenix Park that evening. It was a summer's evening. And I just, I, I actually said to myself, I sat on a bench, a bench seat in the park and I thought, I think I'm going mad. I actually think I'm going mad. And um, I, I went through some awful sort of breakdown for about two weeks after that. And but then, in the sense that you, re- did, you uh, did you at that stage regret your decision? No, I don't think so. I didn't okay. regret it. I needed space. I needed space in my head and I remember going to talk to somebody about it and they said, 
well, you know, look, you've left the job now. You can get another job eventually, hopefully. Um, and and, and I, I think sometimes when you're doing the same thing day in, day out, but there's an undercurrent in your life where there's so much that's just not solid. Everything is is almost moving under your feet and yeah. you don't feel you don't feel steady on the ground. You just don't feel comfortable in yourself. And I just felt, no, I have to get away from this. I, I have to, um, I just have to get away. And we were in the throes of uh, the Celtic Tiger, which was into its final sort of third uh, of, of, of the 10 years that we had it at that stage. So th- there were warning signs, red flags and bells ringing. No one was listening at that stage. I had left a good job. I, I then decided, right, I'm going to move to Galway. That's right. Um, you caught a break in Galway Bay FM. I, I, I did, yeah. Keith Finnegan, great character. Keith rang me and he says, I hear you're in Galway. And I said, yes, I am. He says, oh, come and work for me. He said, um, you know, we'd love to have you on. So I stayed there with Keith and all the team for about two and a half years. Um, by then, things were beginning to settle I was, I, 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 I think also in 2005, and I talk about this in the book, I interviewed Don Baker on my show. Don's a great friend of mine for years. And Don, out of the blue, started talking about his experience um, at St. Conleth's Reformatory College in Dangan in Offaly. And it's well documented. Um, and, you know, he, he got so emotional about the treatment that he endured there during his incarceration mm. and he started crying on, on air mm. and then I started crying because he resurrected in the space of a few seconds what I had been through myself so we were both sitting there on air live crying and I, I was looking out at my crew outside the window and one of them had her hand to her mouth saying, I don't really know what we're meant to do here. We can't just say go to an ad break. So I, I don't ever recall it happening er, anywhere before, but we eventually pulled ourselves together and started talking again. And then we went to an ad break. And of course, all hell broke loose. The, you know, the people who ran the radio station just said, that is just outrageous. That shouldn't have happened. And yet the listeners... Yeah. Could empathize. Who, were, who were the real bosses? Yeah. They texted in and said, "God, talk about healing! I got healing yeah. listening to you guys talking today." So that was another reason why I had to shift myself out of what was traditionally me, and I had to go and look for what was really me, which took me a, a long year, a long time after that to find. And in the book, you talk of those Celtic Tiger years, and there was a period within your life where, of course, you were under an awful lot of financial uh, constraint um, and yeah. uh, on a number of occasions I thought, I thought this was really really interesting and in your your court appearances where you would be in court for financially related matters and the, the the call out would be called out for people who were also in court who wouldn't attend in court because they were no longer alive I don't know did you call it suicide by bank or is that a term that's used yeah yeah that's what it, yes it is yeah yeah um, I remember it was in the, the uh, master of the high court um, and the the, the, the the occasion I appeared in front of the master of the high court uh, a man I have the utmost of respect for Ed Honahan um, and I had the pleasure of meeting him after after that uh, we never discussed obviously that day but I remember meeting him just literally bumping into him um, the, the master of the high court for anyone who doesn't know is, is he, he's like the, the gatekeeper he decides which cases go forward for trial in the high court and mine came up and I owed money and I went in and that day the courtroom was packed full of people 50% of them barristers in you know wigs and gowns and that and then they had their clients uh, and I was representing myself because I was broke and I couldn't afford a yes. barrister. Yeah. So for yeah. the, I think the seven or eight cases before mine, they were called by number. Number 417, um, Mr. X versus, and they'd give a name of a bank, you know. Uh, and the barrister would stand up and say, um, Your Honor, my client is not present today. Um, and the judge would say, Why is that, counsel? And he says, uh, Deceased. And 
Judge Honahan said cause of death and he said suicide. Oh my God. It was so prevalent then, wasn't it? And God knows and we could be back there now. This went on and on. And there were four cases while I sat there before mine. And all I heard was this word cause of death, suicide. And then the case before mine, an elderly man stood up and he, the judge said, are you Mr. So-and-so? He said, yes, I am, Your Honour. And his voice was breaking and he said, where is your barrister? Where is your solicitor? He said, I can't afford one, sir. He said, my house is being repossessed. And he said, well, have you not, can you not get free legal aid? Can you not go to a solicitor? He said, no, sir. He said, I'm here to plead with you. And then he started crying. He said, Judge, don't let them take my house off me, please. And he got down on his knees. Oh, God. And the the barrister for the bank was standing there while he was kneeling on the floor, Neil, crying. The barrister for the bank was saying, Your Honour, this case was brought before you six months ago, but my client claims, our client claims that this individual has not engaged. And the judge at that stage said, wait a minute, sit down. This man is on his knees crying. This decent, kind man who has dignity, he said, show him some respect. And I, it was like watching some sort of Shakespearean drama being played out. And the, the man's daughter came up and helped him up. And Judge Honahan said, how old is your father? And she said, he's nearly 80, Your Honor. He went guarantor for our son. And our son, unfortunately, his business broke down. So now the bank are going to repossess my father's old house, which he's lived in all his life. Amazing story. And the judge said, well, he's not in my court. He said, and he said, Mr. So-and-so, he said, I'm going to suspend this case for 12 months. I want you to get your legal affairs in order and you'll be back here with me this time next year and hopefully we'll be in a better place. That man wanted to hug the judge. He said, what does this mean, Judge? He said, it means you can stay in your house for at least another year and hopefully long after that. And who and knows Mike, what happened with the rest of that story? Well, no, this is it. And then my case came up and I was 418, you know, O'Callaghan versus. And I stood up and the judge looked at me and he said, Mr. O'Callaghan. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you're representing yourself. I said, yes, sir, I am. And it, it, there's that moment where there's dead silence and... Suddenly, and, and I'm, I'm not blowing my showbiz trumpet here when I say this, but there's that moment when you know everyone sitting in that room suddenly knows who you are. Um, and you start talking and you can hear people shuffling saying, that's him, I can recognize his voice. And the place is packed. And talk about even more humiliating. There were 22 students from a transition year sitting oh, at the back man. of the court was one of their teachers listening. Oh. So, the, you know, it, it, it's, it, if, 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 they, if, if people really want to know what financial hardship is, visit the, visit the, the, the master of the high court sessions someday. You can, you can just walk in, bring your sandwiches, spend a couple of hours. It really, it really shows you what real financial hardship can do to people. And I, I, I say it specifically in the book, that the way those treat those people who th- that was way back in 2011, mm. 10 years ago, if those people had just clung on like I clung on, I wonder how different their lives would have been today. You, d- you did cling on um, and I of did. course, and, and moved on and, and got other gigs and what have you and, and, and worked with, with 4FM. Um, but the diagnosis in 2018 of, of MSA where you were told this is a progressively fatal illness. You detail in the book on numerous occasions um, the struggle with just dealing with that, um, the struggle of trying to take it all in, the anger you felt at all of this happiness around you, for instance, when you had been given this diagnosis. Um, That's right, yeah. We, we <clears throat> Paula and I had left the neurologist's office. Um, it was a Friday afternoon. It was the beginning of that beautiful summer heat wave in May 2018 and my neurologist a wonderful kind kind man Professor Peter Kelly said Gareth I want you to come into the matter hospital for a couple of weeks he said we've done all of these tests but as an inpatient he said 
we can do them all again um, and in close quarters very quickly and we can double check them and we can do them a second time. He said, we really need, he said, I've, I've eliminated so many things that it's not. The, the whole thing about a diagnosis is that it's a process of elimination. They literally tell you what it's not. So they're literally running a biro through a, a condition. And unfortunately, by that stage, we were left with what we knew was going to be multiple system atrophy. And um, Professor Kelly said to us that day, he said, I said to him, what are we looking at, Professor? And he said, it would appear we're looking at MSA. And that was when, for the two of us, our world just collapsed. Because like it's progressively only, fatal, irreversible. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no cure. There's nothing to slow it down um, unless you can find some new therapy, which is why I keep looking for these new therapies. Yes. All they can do is, is treat the symptoms and try to give you a prolonged quality of life. But they leave you in no in no doubt what's coming and what's going to happen. And, and, does, and does that involve, forgive me, does that involve perhaps Paula becoming your full-time carer then? Do you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In a word, it does. Um, and we've talked about this. And I like to think that it's it's a long way off. But I'm looking at friends of mine that I've made during the last three years who also have been diagnosed with this. And their progression is beginning to accelerate. Now, I'm literally clinging to every possibility I can find to push things out there and you know some days it works other days it doesn't other days are very debilitating you, you you can barely get out of bed other days are fine you know before lockdown we could head for Currabinny Woods and we could go for a beautiful walk there or don't go down to you know the, the beach in Garrettstown now we're restricted but hopefully the, the, the restriction will lift but mm. it's it, it's I think What's keeping me going is keeping everything within the day, Neil. It's, it's, I find now that the joy is in the small things, which is why I've simplified so much. And I've, I've gotten away from the heavy pressures and stresses and anxieties of the rat race. And, and, you know, what I used to think was important, what I used to think was I, I had to do and I had to achieve. Now my attitude is, why do I have to? It, it's not going to make any difference. But with the, with, with the condition that you have now and going forward and your life before it, do you think that you have had a fair, that life has been fair to you? Yeah, I, 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 I do. Life is what, you know, that, that great talk talk song, life is what you make it. Um, life is what you make of it. I, you know, I, I've heard people say life threw me a bad hand of cards or life... Life never really, it never really gave me any luck. I, I, I don't, I, I don't sit easy with those statements because life is not a person. Life is simply a space within which we live. And sometimes things go well, sometimes things don't. And the anger I felt around about the time of the diagnosis, I had to very quickly reel that in because I knew that while anger can be very useful, if you need to be angry in order to get something sorted, well, then that's fine once the anger dissipates. But, you know, unresolved anger, because you have been diagnosed with an illness, whether it's cancer or whether it's a neurological illness, that eats into you deep, deeply and it actually accelerates mm. the, the, the ailment itself. You know, you've got to get away from the anger. Mm. Mm. And, and, and in that, in that itself is a huge challenge. Sometimes you have to meet his head on every day and say, no, I'm not going to let myself get angry here. Um, so, I, you know, there, you, you, you really do need to kind of get onto a different parallel and walk that in a different space to actually make life worthwhile. You know, with regards to your career as, as, as a, a super duper broadcaster, everyone will agree with that. Just a natural, natural talent that was instilled as a child with a love and a passion of music and communication. Do you think you stopped too early? I mean, do you miss it? Yeah, terribly. Yeah, I, 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 I do. And I'm asked this a lot. You know, did, did I stop too early? Um, I don't believe I did. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't mind saying 
quite publicly that I had reached a stage where I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. Um, I listen to you in the mornings and I can hear, I can hear the thrill in your voice. I can hear the challenge in your voice. I, I can hear the fact that you're hungry for what you do. I, I still have that. But I, I had, over the 40 years, I had a number of periods where I would have been involved in talk radio. And they were the times I really loved. Now, the music radio I did back in the RTE days as well, that was very satisfying. But radio now has become very much, uh, here's four songs in a row and I'm going to speak for 20 seconds. And that's all very well if you're a young guy or a young girl starting out. And you have it all before you. And there's great potential and choice that will come from that because you're on a very, very privileged public platform. Mm. But when you're getting close to 60 and somebody's saying to you, no, you've got to play four in a row and you can only talk for 30 seconds Mm. after that. Well, yeah, while I need the weekly wage, Mm. um, I I just, I felt, no, I'm I'm worth more than I understand. Yeah, no, I do understand. I I don't need that, you know. And and, and we um, we touched on radio moments. Uh, I won't keep you much longer. Uh, No, there's no worry. We we touched on radio moments. Mother was obviously... Larry Gogan, uh, another one was the yeah. Don Baker moment. But was there one outstanding, fondest or most special radio moment? I mean, for instance, you were, I wasn't on air that day, I was in the morning, but you were on air when the planes hit the Twin Tower, for instance. And you, yeah. you go into this beautifully in the book, and not just for me as a broadcaster, I think anybody who reads it will, will understand what you were going through in a live scenario. Because you were very much caught on the hop as to, do I, just talk to us about that. Do I stay with this story? You know, how do I react to it? It was unfolding live. Was that the moment, do you think? Yes, it was. It, it was a Tuesday afternoon. It was five, it was just about eight minutes to two. And I watched CNN on the screen in front of me. Um, now, you've got to remember that, you know, we'd no Facebook and we'd no Twitter and no Instagram back then. This was 2001. We, we thankfully had email and we had uh, we had SMS texts. Um, and just as the sports news began, I realized that CNN were doing a rerun. So I hit the button called pre-fade listen, which means that if you're if you're watching television, you can actually hit this button and you can hear it in your headphones while the radio show is still continuing. And I realized that the two morning news people on CNN had just described that a passenger plane had crashed into the uh, North Tower of the World Trade Center. And this was live. This was real. And John Kenny was reading the sports news and I broke into his sports news and he looked at me as if to say, I'm reading the sports. What are you doing? Yeah. And, I, and I said, look, look at the television behind you. I, this is live on air. I said, I, I, a passenger plane has just hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And with that, we were then live. And it was at that moment that the second plane came veering in across that beautiful blue dawn sky across Manhattan. Huge, big plane. And it banked 45, 90 degrees and literally turned, accelerated and then hit the South Tower midway, round about, I think, the 74th floor. And I'll never forget seeing the speed of it hit the tower. And then I thought it would come out the far side, but it didn't. But yet there was that huge explosion of kerosene fuel and then all of the paper you know, the stationery and all that sort of stuff floating down. And that, it was at that moment, as you say, do I run with this or do I just press the jingle and start the song? And I said to myself in a split second, one of those sliding doors moments, I said, I'm going to sit with this. Did you stay with it for an hour, two hours? Did you take calls on it? Did you manage Three to hours. contact anybody in, in New York? Things like that? Three hours. Wow. Three hours. We, we we didn't play a single song. Um, all we did was we obviously had to um, comply with obligations to play the commercial breaks. Um, I think you got Connor Cleary from the Irish Times in, in America. Yes, and things, yeah. yeah, he was in, he, he in a department in, in New York at that stage. We got another guy from County Mayo who was working in the Chrysler Tower who was able to describe the, the actual South Tower collapsing for his live on air. He cried. Uh, we also had someone on 
from Aer Lingus in New York, um, one of the ground staff, they were waiting on the plane to come in and they just wanted to let everybody know here at home that it had been uh, diverted to Newfoundland. Um, uh, that it, it was it was extraordinary. We were looking at people texting saying, please say hello to my mom and tell her I'm okay. I only started work here the other day, but I'm doing fine. I'm not in the building. Was that um, your radio moment, do you think? Yes, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And do you know... Neil, it, it, it changed everything for me after that. I, I think I could never go back into the radio studio yes. again after that day yeah. because something had shifted. And the the, the, the the wonderful task of making people laugh and playing, you know, good, catchy, upbeat, spirit-lifting music, that was gone after that day. It's um, it's an amazing book, a memoir about hope and finding a way through the dark. Um, Gareth O'Callaghan's new book is called What Matters Now, and I've only touched on it, as you can well appreciate, as the man who wrote it. But um, thanks so much for catching up with us. I know we'll, we will stay in touch on, the, on oh, your absolutely, journey. absolutely, yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I want to wish you and, and Paula well as we hopefully in the next couple of weeks come out of some kind of lockdown and get to spread our wings a little bit more. Yeah, and, and can I just say, if I've if I just one more minute, Neil, something you said to me, I think at the end of the last chat we had, which I, which I always enjoy having, by the way, you said, you. every one of us needs a Paula. And it, it was something that resonated with me. And if, if I can just say thank you to her publicly today, because I don't get a chance to do this very often, that she has been my rock. And I genuinely mean this. You know, we, we, we met six years ago last Saturday in the voodoo rooms and every day since then has been a joy. It turned my life around and all I can tell her is that I love her beyond words and I'm so grateful to her for everything that she does for me. What a lovely way to finish our conversation, Gareth. Thanks so much in regards to and to Paula going forward. Thanks, Neil. Well. Great to chat to you. Take and care you of yourself. Too, pal. Take care. Gareth O'Callaghan, What Matters Now, his new book. Uh, buy it for yourself. Buy it for a loved one. Just buy it.